Hello everybody and welcome back to Space's Hard Vacuum, Episode 9 with Cerberus. Where today, we already have a build done for the next project, the Microbial Analysis Probe for the Lunar Environment, Mark 1. Most of you might have probably noticed already that that's maple. It's the maple Mark 1. The very keen among you may have noticed the flag on the rocket and the red and white paint scheme. And the Canadian among you may have noticed that from the upload date of this video, tomorrow's the 1st of July. So, it's a Canada Day themed Space is Hard Vacuum, where we're launching an American microbiology analysis probe on a very Canadian looking rocket. Because we're all one big happy continent anyway. Maybe next week I'll add some blue on there and we'll do a we'll do a, a slightly late 4th of July edition. Who knows? I can be generous like that. One thing you may see right here, or here, I suppose, or maybe not here. This is sort of the silent rocket. And that is it has to do with the way the way the mods I have treat minimum throttle levels combined with the way the game treats throttle levels in general. The engine on the first stage of this rocket can throttle down to a minimum of 67%. So that actually means in the game that, you know, when you throttle up to full, of course, that's still 100%, but you throttle all the way down to just above zero so the rocket's lit, and it's at 67%. So with a throttle setting that looks like about 50%, I'm actually kind of more in the range of 80 to 85%. But as far as the game is concerned, I'm throttled to about 50% right now, so it's giving us a half-throttle sound and a half-throttle rocket plume. But, uh, well, not much I can do about that. Um, because, of course, other things that are going to happen uh, in this video are full volume, and selectively altering that was... Well, let's just say I'd already spent 10 hours on this project by the time this video got edited, and that doesn't count the commentary you're hearing, so I left that part alone. Having a little bit of trouble there, keeping it steady. I'm making some manual adjustments. And I decide, okay, well, we'll see how it holds a prograde. And it doesn't hold a prograde all that well right now because it's gotten rather top heavy. That big, uh, that big first stage is burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, so it goes through that quite quickly. And it's also not as heavy as it as you'd expect to begin with, so we end up with what very quickly becomes a pretty top heavy rocket. And. Uh, the gimbal goes a little, it overdoes it a little bit, but that's okay, we we have good old SAS, stock SAS to back us up, and it's it handles it a, a lot better in this situation. Um, mech jab and, and uh, the smart ass settings are certainly better sometimes, but sometimes simple is better. In any case, we made it through that part of the launch, and we ditched that one away with our Patented new separation system, which involves sticking separatrons backwards and upside down inside <laughs> the inner stage adapter on the lower stage. And I'm going to skip a circularization burn. And here we are after doing the circularization burn. Because honestly, it took six minutes, and it looks a lot like any other time I've done a circularization burn. The, uh, I guess one drawback to doing all this realism stuff is when everything is full size like this, stuff takes a while. And there are some things where when you've seen it once, you really have seen it a thousand times, and that's one of them. So off we go. We're going to the moon. And we're, initially I wasn't, the, the, the rocket wasn't built with taking the entire second stage to the moon in mind, but later design iterations had me increasing the size of the lower stage and the upper stage several times over, in fact, partly just to deal with the fact that I had what was basically an overpowered engine on that upper stage, which is why I just ran it the whole time at around 83% throttle. 
So we have some fuel left, which we use to actually, we end up being able to take it with us and, and, and hold it in there for quite some time. It is a cryogenic tank. So the liquid hydrogen that's in there, it's uh, again, an, uh, a hydrolox upper stage. It does boil off a bit, but it's quite reasonable with the cryogenic insulation. So we managed to keep a lot of that with us and then followed many, many minutes, most of which I've skipped here of me dinking around with maneuver nodes, just trying to optimize the use of the fuel I had left. I was, I was a little concerned about not having enough to make the return burn because I didn't actually do all of the math. That's one thing I don't usually have time to do is all of the all of the math with impulses and fuel deficiencies and burn times and all that kind of thing. So I kind of it's partially intuition and partially experience and partially blind guessing. So now I'm there just trying to make sure I can I mean there there are many ways to the same many means to the same end when you're out in space at least sometimes, but uh, as we circularize that orbit around the moon and spend a little bit of time here, I had already figured out the way to do it, and I did have enough fuel as long as I kept the second stage with me as long as possible. Now this next part, I did save on a little bit of fuel by not completely circularizing my orbit around the moon. So only within... 20 minutes or so at either side of Perilune, uh, was I actually low enough to do the experiments on this probe, or to collect the data, I guess, and do the experiments on this probe. So what you're going to see here next is a very quick summary of the many passes that it took for me to do this. And I did burn a little more fuel there to bring my ap Apolune, Apolune, down slightly just to make the orbit shorter so that I could get it all over with a little bit quicker. And then the other thing that happened to me there was that I was actually coming in too low uh, because there is a... S well, the modder himself would actually call it a hack, so I'll call it a hack as well. Below 27,000 meters altitude, it's actually considered that you're flying high. But in the end, after many passes and some orbital corrections, we get that done. And the radiation analysis in low orbit of the moon is complete, and we send that data home for the boys back in the lab to churn in the machines and turn into sweet, sweet science. That one took 6,000 data. The next one, the biosample analysis, is actually going to take all 12,000. We need a full tank of data which means more low orbital passes over and over again. But eventually, we get it done. We get all 12,000 of the science, of the data. I cannot get through a video without mixing those two up at least once. We get all the stuff, and we read about the successful completion of the experiment and how the text there is not quite entirely accurate, because I'm pretty sure it's talking about the Swedish government or something like that. It's not fully clear on my preview as I record the commentary, unfortunately. But I know it's worth 400 science, and we don't send that home with us because this is one of the ones where we have samples on board, and we need to bring them home. And that's exactly what we are about to do. As we use the, not even the last, but we use some of the remaining RCS fuel. I used MMH and dinitrogen tetroxide for extra power on the RCS system to actually bring us down suborbital, and then we let it go. And then the actual probe body, which had been, it had been my, my plan for this to be kind of the operating vehicle for most of this flight, but it ends up just being used basically for the return trip. It has its own RCS, as you can see, and its own fuel. So we move it aside, turn it around, and do a little bit of a prograde burn just to put us out past it, just to be absolutely certain that we don't smack into it when we make our escape burn or our return burn. And we leave it behind to crash violently into the surface, and we head home to Earth. Looking beautiful as it spins around wildly at 10,000 times time acceleration, under 
at least two times playback acceleration. And so begins many, many passes of arrow braking. I didn't want to do it all at once because a, a, a single return through the atmosphere from all the way up at the moon, you're going pretty fast when you come back from the moon, over 10 kilometers per second. Uh, I wanted to do some arrow braking first. However, unfortunately, I was nowhere near aggressive enough on the arrow braking, so it took many, many, many passes. This was just one. I think we've seen three or four, and oh, don't you worry, there's there's more yet. And I'm playing them back nice and fast for you guys, because these, these trips started to take, these just within the atmosphere started to take seven, eight minutes at a time, and you've got to do it in real time. I mean, you can do it two times, three or four if you're really, if you're really ballsy, but you can't do ten, a hundred times time acceleration through the atmosphere, so you just got to sit here. Let the probe tumble around. And we aren't even getting re-entry effects because the atmosphere is still so thin. I really, in, in the future, I will learn to at least make the first error brake pass a little more aggressive. Not so aggressive that we burn anything off or make it explode, but aggressive enough that we do most of the braking. And, you know, maybe we do it in two or three passes. I'd be okay with two or three, even four or five. I think this took something like 12, which was... Um, not a very efficient use of my real time, that's for sure. So I, I made it a bit more aggressive. Uh, I had done 85 kilometer perigees. I went to 80. Now you're seeing some 75. So we're getting low enough and still fast enough to see a little bit of re-entry heat effects there. But fortunately, the air is thin enough that we uh, didn't have any real problems. And here we have, I've detached the probe. I'm making what I hope to be the final pass. And you might see there, or at least you will see soon when I do a different camera angle, right there, we've got a passenger. That is the stack separator that was holding and was meant to separate my probe, as you see with its heat shield, from kind of the service module, if you will, which had the fuel tank and the engine and the RCS. Or some of the RCS. The probe has a little tank of its own and some thrusters. They won't do us any good here, though. And... Eventually, I'm just waiting for this thing to explode and hope it doesn't disrupt the flight of the probe because it's all going so well, other than this one little issue, <laughs> which, of course, made me think at any time it could all go wrong, but finally it overheats and explodes and leaves us to fall relatively harmlessly down through the atmosphere, and it's all very, it's all very calm, relatively speaking. Um, temps don't get too high. I, I, I might have passed 600 for a while at a point that I believe I've edited out. I don't think it ever got hotter than 700, though. And as far as I'm concerned, anytime, anytime I can keep my heat shield below 1,000 degrees, I'm doing excellently. So that tells me again that... It, again, it's another lesson. It's not an actual learning... It's not an actual earning science points for the tech tree lesson... But it's definitely a, a personal gameplay lesson that I know now that I can be much, much more aggressive on my error breaking when returning things from the moon. Which is important experience to have when it's going to come time eventually to bring some Kerbals back from there. And of course the next several minutes, much of which I will skip for you is just this thing falling slowly. Well, quickly, actually, but... You know, after flying around the 10 kilometers per second, 100 meters per second ain't that much. And there we go. A nice, gentle descent. And we bounce a couple of times. And the... flags, which apparently had some cheap, sticky tape back backing them, holding them onto the probe, just immediately wash off in the ocean. And we have a look at the 420 science we got just from the probe itself. 400 on the samples, and 20 for recovering a vehicle from a suborbital flight on the moon. And yes, it, it did. It was, for a few minutes, suborbital when we ditched the second stage of the rocket. So, we'll take it. Add it to the 200 we earned that we transmitted home for the radiation readings, 
and it's off to the science center to see what kind of goodies we can get. And immediately, I look at the advanced electronics and I think it has solar panels that spin and track the sun. I want those. I want that one, and I want that one. And, well, apparently I don't want them now. I, I think, well, I'll get to them later. I definitely want radiators, though. Yeah, radiators. I get distracted by the radiators. Though the solar panels are definitely useful, I really want them, and I know I need to get them. Electric generators, a uh, thousand science. It's a little bit, pa a little bit out of our league right now, but I have a look. They won't be of any use to us until we get some reactors to go with them and generate thermal power anyway. But we have, actually there's some solar panels there as well in the radiator section. And we are going to need some radiators for those long trips to Venus and Mars with our research probes. Or at least it'll be good to have them just in case. And I look at the electronics again, and then again I think, oh, I'll get them in a second. Let's look at some other stuff. <clears throat> Life support systems? Yeah, okay, yeah, we need those. We're going to do some long-term flights of at least a few days, maybe a week or two. Kind of do it uh, Gemini program style, maybe. Um, and do some, you know, some week or two long flights. Test out our Kerbal's endurance in space. And then I think, you know what? Almost every video I do, I look at high-altitude flight and then I think, no, nah, I don't need that yet. Finally, even though I still don't really feel I need it, I think, ah. Maybe we can have some fun with it in a near future episode, so I grab that too. I look at the next one, because I had never seen it before, hypersonic flight. That's going to be definitely fun a little down the road. But then I don't get those electrical, that electrical node. I'll have to get that one next time I play the game. But that's it for this time around on Space's Hard Vacuum. I look forward to seeing you guys next time. I thank you for watching, and we'll send some probes to Mars and or Venus. I will see you then. Today's episode of Space is Hard Vacuum is brought to you by the number that. And the word of the day is Julian. Happy Kerbling!